Hey, this is Rob, and this is episode 38 of the Folly Coffee Podcast. Let's get it brewing. All right. So for this episode, I spoke with Taylor Miner, who is the co-founder of this product here. If you're not watching the video, I am holding up a packet of Third Wave Water. Third Wave Water is this amazing product. It's coffee brewing minerals. So Taylor Miner and his co-founder created a profile of minerals to mix with distilled water to get a much better water profile for brewing at home. This story had everything. It had a successful Kickstarter. They ended up on Shark Tank. They got a deal on Shark Tank. Did they end up going through with that deal? You'll have to listen and or watch this episode to find out. So enjoy. Hey, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. Per oh, you got the legit setup as well. I love it. Yes. That's what I like to My see. My sexy NPR voice. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Really excited to have you on. Fits right in line with what we like to cover in the podcast. I kind of say it's about uh, coffee, small business, people, and stories. And so mm -hmm. this is perfect. Uh, I'll just kind of introduce you right now. I'm with Taylor Miner of Third Wave Water. Uh, so I personally found out about third wave water from my buddy Barnaby, who's another coffee professional in town. And I had the full home set up and things were really good. Uh, and then I moved. And the new place I moved to here in St. Louis Park, our water is really, really hard to the point where if you brew two batches, my kettle is already starting to scale. And I didn't really think about this too much until someone said, well, have you done any third wave water? And that was Barnaby. And so he, uh, he convinced me to get that first order of third wave water. You got a gallon of distilled water, threw it in there, mix it up and brew that first cup. And it was the best cup that I brewed at home. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like go to Amazon, subscribe. And I'm just like, got, got the third wave water auto on autopilot ship into my place. And so I want to hear your story. I, I think there's kind of two sides to the third wave water story. In my opinion, the, coffee side obviously and then the business side of just like the hyper niche of minerals for brewing coffee which to a non-coffee nerd is like how could someone make a business around that yeah, yeah absolutely yeah so i had uh had owned a coffee roaster coffee shop started back in 2008 and so i was already in kind of that specialty niche coffee world um my business partner had a coffee subscription company and that's how we met. Uh, I was one of his roasters and we were at lunch one day uh, after I installed a cold brew uh, tap at an office co-share. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty coffee story. Um, we we're at lunch and I had already had this kind of high end water filtration system for my store that I'd, I'd built myself because we have really hard water. And uh, he said, man, I wish I could ship your water to my customers. And I kind of jokingly said, well, let's ship them dehydrated water. Um, and then after we kind of, you know, laughed a little bit, I'm like, hey, you know, actually we might be able to do that. So um, after that meeting, I went on Amazon, ordered some minerals, uh, mixed kind of like the first uh, iteration up and then dropped it off to him. And then about a week later, he's like, hey, that was amazing. We should do something with this. Um, so, I mean, it was pretty quick from kind of conception to, to, you know, to, you know, really going at it and seeing, seeing what happens. So when you're looking at the minerals that you want to mix into this distilled water, RO water, what is the kind of balance you're looking for, for the perfect cup of coffee? Yeah. So it's, you're balancing a lot of different things. You're balancing, you know, what's actually dissolvable in water. You're balancing taste, obviously. You're balancing um, what minerals could potentially destroy my equipment, um, even if I were to, you know, if they were to be mixed wrong. So, for instance, calcium chloride, the, the powder mineral, dissolves really well in water. But if you leave the powder out on, like, a stainless steel countertop, it'll rust it within 24 hours. I mean, it's, it can be really aggressive. And um, we also knew that uh, with, with high levels of chlorides, you can get really um, uh, uh, bad things going on with like stainless steel boilers and things like that. So uh, that, and then, then um, uh, 
really trying to get something that would mix well together, would, would store well together. So it was kind of balancing a bunch of different things just because it, water can be difficult and, um, uh, there, there's no really perfect water, but it's more of, Hey, what can we, if we can balance all those things, right? When you're same with thing when you're brewing coffee, right? There are grinders probably that are better than the grinder you have, but yeah, they cost, you know, 10 times as much, or there might be a brew method, man, this really tastes good, but it takes 10 minutes where, you know, this one is, is quick. So, you know, we do this normally where we kind of balance things out. So our goal was to make like a really good water profile that was easy, that was duplicable, that can be shared with anybody, you know, anywhere around the world. So that was kind of, um, you know, going into it was really a, this practical approach after, you know, having owned a coffee shop. You know, I, I, if my customers asked about water, I really couldn't say, oh, you know, go to homebarista.com uh, and uh, uh, check out this comment thread and learn to make your own water or go to, you know, our coffee Reddit. And, uh, and that's really not a practical approach for 99% of coffee drinkers out there. And so it was really trying to make something that, you know, my mom, my grandma, or my customers could, could use easily. And what is it about, what are the most common things you see with like tap water or just water people are using at home that's causing their coffee not to be at its peak? Yeah. The, the big part is the calcium in there. That's the stuff that creates the lime scale that, uh, that's the same thing that's in antacid. So for instance, here we have a hardness of like 350 TDS and in a one gallon jug of water, that's the equivalent to about three tums um, worth of antacid. So, um, I mean, oh, so, so if I have spicy you, food, just, I should be drinking more of my tap water. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's <laughs> alkaline, alkali water. Um, so, so it's, if you're looking for fruit flavors, floral flavors, acidity pairs well, it's like trying to imagine orange juice without acidity, right? They just, they go together. So if your coffee does have, is, is a lighter and has those fruit, those floral, those sweet notes, and then you take out the acidity, you just won't taste those things. Mm -hmm. um, that's what happens when you get that high calcium. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, and then, you know, anything else that's in there, like the chlorides or the chloramines, um, those are those uh, kind of chemicals they use to treat water, but they can be pretty difficult to get out sometimes and uh, they do uh, negatively impact the cup. And how many iterations of, of third wave water did it take until you said this is kind of the, the perfect balance we're looking for that it's uh, the, 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 the most, the best profile that's going to satisfy the most people. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that many, maybe five, but a, a lot of it was we had this, you know, I had this tacit knowledge having going, been going to, you know, symposiums to trade shows, you know, uh, you know, uh, Maxwell's book, a water for coffee, uh, his and, and Chris's book. Um, you know, I, I had gotten when it first came out, met them at uh, the symposium where they were speaking on it. Uh, I had, you know, had been on the forums kind of looking at different water profiles that are out there. And, and so I already knew that, like that. Um, so a lot of that work had been done already. Um, and, and a lot of opinions were out there from, from reputable people. So it was kind of taking that and then, you know, now looking at those other things, okay, how can we practically get it together? How can we get mm -hmm. it to mix and to be still, you know, free flowing? Um, how can we get it? So, uh, you know, you can't mess it up. Um, and so, so those were those other considerations kind of putting into it, um, you know, after yeah, that kind of initial wag. It seems like one of those ideas that within the coffee world, it's like common knowledge that yes, water is very, very important to bring a great cup of coffee and people on the extreme are doing it themselves at home. And yet it's, it's almost like the opportunity was there and no one thought to, Hey, maybe there's enough people that don't want to go through the trouble of collecting the minerals themselves and mixing them, but still want to have that perfect water to be able to brew with. And so I'm curious, uh, what year did you found your coffee company? Uh, 2008. And what was your background prior to, and what's the name of that coffee company? Uh, it was, uh, uh, it started off as Stony Creek Roasters and we changed it to uh, Telemetry Coffee Roasters. Um, and then uh, I sold it uh, the end of 2018 and it's now Orion Coffee Roasters. Okay. But um, yeah, I'd used a uh, uh, Ambex, um, uh, wine 15 that I rebuilt and put kind of a artisan roaster scope on there, put a, some new bloom tip burners where you could with a proportional valve. So that, 
uh, I'd been in, you know, modding coffee stuff, uh, uh, and really tinkering. But I think on that idea of yes, coffee professionals are really good at making coffee better and fantastic, but we're also really good at making things complicated and maybe overcomplicated. And uh, uh, one push I had always had was how can I make things less complicated? How can I make really good coffee in a, uh, a, a Mr. Coffee $15 coffee maker? Because I really felt like that that's what my customers were wanting um trying to push them to you know uh some weird uh you know coffee brewer like the dragon coffee maker that Todd Carmichael has um which is great by the way I have one but it's not practical to say to my customers oh here's this great recipe you know that's really something for um you know coffee professionals who really want to geek out and maybe push something that little extra step so uh, a big thing was, okay, how can we make something that is, uh, you know, makes coffee better for, for everybody. I love, that is such a good point that I think there's almost this thing with coffee that it's like, we need to convince people it's way harder than it is so that when they see what we're doing, that it seems like, Oh, I could never do that. But I look at it the same way that I go, most people are never going to, get a pour over setup. They might not even get a French press because it's like, oh, I don't want to do this or that. Most people are going to stick with the coffee maker they have. And so I look at it the same way that it's like, hey, am I going to shun them for using a $15 Mr. Coffee? Well, no, because that's what most people do. Will our coffee taste better than what they're currently brewing in that Mr. Coffee? Yeah, hopefully. And then the last part is like, I've been I just did a little episode about cleaning because I realized I went to a friend's house, had some on a Mr. Coffee and you're like, Oh, I can taste every coffee, every dark, <laughs> dark roast you've had on here for the past 20 years. Uh, and so you meet your business partner. How quickly does it go from uh, joking about dehydrated water to ship to actually beginning the formulation and then the business becomes an actual thing? Yeah, that was the crazy part. And, and that if that, if we had this plan to start with, you know, it would have been inadvisable, but we came up with the idea in July of 2016, we started tinkering around with it. Um, we were just people we know were sending out some samples. Hey, test this. Our first uh, description was coffee spice, like in Dune kind of, uh, uh, a little nerdy homage. Um, and then it was the beginning of October. We decided, Hey, let's do this for real. Uh, and we decided to launch it at a barista guild event in Chicago, uh, uh, bloom, which was at the end of October. So we, we said, you know, for real, let's make this. We launched it in three weeks. Um, so it went to bloom. Uh, we got, first couple of sales in November and December decided to do a Kickstarter. We launched that in January, second week. Um, it funded in um, 11 hours, um, got a lot of press. Then we got a phone call or an email in February from the producers of Shark Tank. And they're like, Hey, uh, we think you'd be great on the show. You should apply. And I thought it was spam at first, but we, right. we went through that process and, you know, the whole time we knew that the odds of getting on, they said 30,000 people apply every year and 120 make it on the show. So it's not good odds, but we're like, Hey, let's just give it a go. Um, we ended up filming shark tank in June and then it aired in October. So we went from launch to airing on shark tank in under a year, which, um, you know, isn't really a good business plan if that's kind of your <laughs> idea from the get go. What was that experience like? What's the behind the scenes of Shark Tank? I know anybody who's interested in entrepreneur business owners have probably watched their fair share. I've always been curious what the back end of it is like, because I know I've read articles that it's like, hey, most of the deals end up actually not happening or, you know, a lot of it's just for the show. How much of it is yeah. legitimate? So... I would say, I mean, the core of it is absolutely legitimate. Um, mm -hmm. The feeling that you get from watching the show is the exact same feeling I had filming it. 
they do a really good job. The sharks have no idea who you are until you walk out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, one thing that was really good, it was, it was really good exercise for us to kind of hone our business because as Mm -hmm. the producers are kind of whittling you down to these next steps, they're like, Hey, send us a, you know, five minute tape of this, you know, be extra kind of, uh, animated, right. Uh, you know, really sell us on you and your story. So each step of the way would be like, okay, so, you know, send us back these 30 pages of documents signed, uh, you know, uh, send us this video you do. And then like, we'll contact you in two weeks. If we, you know, you go to the next kind of, uh, and so they that kept happening. We're just hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, be really flexible. And then, you know, in any business, I mean, you have no money. Um, and, and so th- they do fly you out there and we had to pay for our set. Um, we had, uh, uh, uh partnered with Onyx really early on. And, and so Dylan was, the uh, U.S. Brewers Cup champ, and uh, he was using our stuff. Onyx um, Coffee Roasters? Cr- yes, correct. Okay. Um, not the coffee importer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, the Our backup brewer uh, was Pete Licata, which is a heck of a backup, um, just in case uh, uh, Dylan couldn't get there. So Dylan was competing in the, the Worlds, and he flew uh, right from Istanbul to L.A., to film, um, our episode. And, uh, so it was, it was crazy. I, we flew in there on a, a Saturday, uh, built our set Saturday night, Sunday. We, it was on father's day. We pitched in front of the producers and then they said, go back to the hotel. We'll let you know tonight if you film tomorrow. So you don't even know if you're going to film at this point. No, no, no. They still, they over, like they overbook that first. So we got so it in you, a text. You fly out there. They tell you, you have to pitch our producers and then we decide while you're out here, if you're going to be on the actual yes. show. <laughs> yes. And then they film about 200 um, businesses and only about 120. So there were a couple um, guys who had their, uh, their pitch that same day and theirs didn't air. So you can even get cut after that. So it was at nine o'clock at night on that Sunday that we got a text that said, be out front at six forty five in the morning. <laughs> um, so yeah. And we, we, we were ready. Um, but I, me being a, a big man, I was sad because the breakfast didn't start till seven at the hotel. <laughs> it's always a nightmare. And, and I'm like, Oh man, this, <laughs> it can't get any worse. Um, <laughs> so, so we go there, they have a trailer with our, you know, they, 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 they didn't put our name on it. They had like a, a pseudonym just so, because I said the sharks used to send people around to do research on the businesses before. Because so we they're had this, legitimately looking at investment yeah, companies. Yeah, so absolutely. Like, oh. Absolutely. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had a code name. We then filmed and we were done filming by 10 a.m. Um, and and it was it was it was crazy. Um, so, yeah, that was we've, we've I think we were probably there for like about 30 minutes actually on the stage filming. Um, and that was uh, that was kind of uh, nerve wracking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was that experience like? What was the, the feedback or how was it received? Yeah. So fortunately LA water is terrible. They have super hard water. So we brought our like TDS meter and stuff and we're testing water, different parts. Uh, turned out our hotel was bad. So we just filled up a five gallon jug, um, and, uh, uh, of, you know, their tap water at the hotel. Um, and then, you know, we had this uh, kind of going into it. We knew like, okay, the sharks probably aren't, um, you know, super coffee people, right. So they're not going to want something super light. So, uh, again, with Onyx Coffee Roasters, we were like, hey, what, what kind of coffee do you have that's that a good light roast, but also kind of a, a crowd pleaser, something that maybe has a little yeah, more of the nuts like and familiar. chocolates. Yeah, it's like yeah, a yeah. So, roast. Oh, man, this is so intriguing. I'm sorry. So, so it was like we went with like a, a really good Honduran that they had that, that had, um, you know, had some chocolate and some nut, but also had some fruit um, and, mm-hmm. and, and some floral, but wasn't, wasn't an acid bomb. And so... Uh, and then Dylan did a uh, double Chemex kind of pour over. Um, we actually had to do it right before. So we had to time it and be like, okay, we don't have time to actually Sit do the pour brew. over. <laughs> so like we had to time it and be like, okay, it looks like the other one's about done. So brew the one you're going to serve them because we also don't want it to be cold. And then you go out there and then you brew again as kind of a dummy 
And then we pour them the coffee that we had made just prior. Um, yeah, it's like the cooking show where they're like, then you put it yes. in the oven for an hour and yes. this is what it looks like. Oh, that's yeah. so and, smart. And, and then we had gotten a lot of like cool equipment for our, our, um, our set. So the whole back of the set was just like a vinyl, but again, again, this, they don't pay for that. So there are some yeah. sets that are elaborate and cost a ton of money. And we just, we didn't have that. So we, we borrowed some co- uh, commercial coffee makers from Curtis because they were there in LA. Um, uh, we, we got a, 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 a what ratio eight um, from Clive coffee. Uh, they sent us two of those. And so that was kind of, we had this cafe, the kitchen model, like, Hey, you know, you want cafe quality coffee at home. So we kind of had this, you know, half of those. Yeah. It was a cafe, mock cafe with the commercial brewer. Half was the, um, with the home brewer. And then we had, you know, Dylan doing the double kind of Chemex uh, pour over. Um, so yeah, the, the, all the sharks, I mean, we gave them a cup of each. Um, and, uh, uh, I, it was, it was an obvious difference and they were, I think were skeptical until they tried it. And then they're like, Oh yeah, no, like, uh, uh, Mark Cuban said, you know, Oh, there's no question. This tastes 10 times better. Um, his, uh, his thing was he did, he thought it was too niche. And, uh, and, and how were you feeling in that moment when the coffee, cause this is the most nerve wracking for any coffee nerd. I try to convert people all the time to specialty coffee and I get nervous when I'm like, here, taste this. And it's just, how, how are you feeling in that moment where they're passing out the coffees? Cause in a sense, this is your business on a national platform, not even in a sense, literally in on a national platform and they're going to air whatever these people say about the final product. Yeah, no, that is the thing uh, we were worried about. Uh, you do get good as a coffee professional at, at judging people when they walk into your store and, mm-hmm. and, and helping them pick stuff out. Right. So yeah. I, we had read all the biographies of each shark, um, you know, like, Hey, can we kind of tell what they like? You know, we were like, okay, we know their Smart. age, we know their demographics, just like you would do in a cafe. Like I'm yeah. going to recommend this coffee to you. And so th- that was kind of going in, picking out that Honduran coffee. Um, you know, we tasted it in the hotel and we're like, Oh yeah, th- there's a, there's a, noticeable difference enough of a clear difference yeah i think we had also brought some other coffees just in case um we needed to you know hey let's pivot to this one or that one but that the original honduran was was it was a great coffee to begin with um mm-hmm. the but no it basically it was like okay if they don't like it and they start um bombing on it how can we look graceful and losing um and so uh, yeah, you, what you don't want is one of those people that that double down on the cringe and, yeah. um, and, and then it's just, it's, yeah. Yeah. So that was, um, so yeah, we, I mean, we, we barely got a deal on the show and I think it was because they liked us. Um, I had, uh, read Barbara Corcoran's book and talked about how she sold her company. I think it was for $55 million. Um, if I recall. And so they're like, how did you value your company? And I had made an offhanded comment. Oh, Barbara, we should have valued it at 55 million. It worked out well for you. And I, I, I think part of that kind of endeared her to us. And she's mm-hmm. like, Hey, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, uh, I, I like them. Um, you know, cause that, that is part of the business. You can have a great business plan. You can have toxic business partners or founders and it, mm-hmm. it's just not going to work. Um, most of the time you have a, decent business plan and you have to also have decent people and, you know, work really hard to kind of get it right. So there are the extremes, but uh, our goal was okay of the things we can change. We we did do some research and they said that uh, two white straight men with no facial hair had the best chances of getting uh, funded based off of all of their results. So we're like, okay, we're going to shave because uh, you know, I can't control anything else, but so apparently having facial hair, um, you know, you have less odds of, of getting funded. So, uh, yeah, we, we also knew that kind of having a positive story, you know, getting funded even, um, you know, if it, you know, you go in kind of asking for, you know, more, right. Kind of starting here and then they go here and then you kind of meet in the middle. So, um, uh, you know, we were happy with the deal that had got struck with Barbara on the show. It ended up not funding. So that's again, common about half of the businesses that get funded on the show don't end up completely funding. Um, 
in the end. And that's, that's, it's okay. We were, we had more in sales in the first day than she was going to fund us. And so when she decided that she didn't, uh, didn't want, um, didn't want in, you know, we were, I mean, it was, uh, there was no hard feelings at all. So yeah, the exposure of being on that platform is generated th- those sales, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then we've had like this year, we've had a rerun um, about once a month. Mm-hmm. And so you just get this massive spike in sales from, Crazy. you know, something that you don't have any control of. So yeah. And so going back to your Kickstarter, having a really successful Kickstarter, do you or your uh, found your co-founder have a background in marketing in the, with, with the skills and necessary to launch a Kickstarter or do you think it was just uh, organic word of mouth that helped fund that? No, I mean, it was really purposeful. So I, I mean, when I met Charles uh, early on, I, I thought we clicked really well and I said to myself, Hey, I would like to do something in business with him. We, we, we both read a ton of books and, you know, kind of, you know, like polymaths in, in that sense where, or, or is that autodidact or whatever the, uh, kind of self-taught, self-learned, um, where we really, uh, you know, try to dive into stuff, get into the, you know, the money ball perspective. So when we did decide to do a Kickstarter, we went and looked at all of the numbers. Okay. You know, and just like business, how many customers do you think you're going to have? How, does, how many backers? What's the, um, the average, um, you know, uh, dollar amount for supporting? What, what are the best different, um, kind of uh, tiers to have? How should we do shipping? Uh, what day should we release it? How, you know, how long should our video be? So there were a lot of good resources that people have already done of uh, just because there's so much information uh, from Kickstarter of failed and successful um, uh, pitches. So you can go in there and see the, the, you know, the stats behind the curtain and with that information really go in and, and, you know, it's almost like having insider information. And so we did a lot of research, you know, even down to the day and the time where we launched it, um, where, uh, and, and then some, there were recommendations on, okay, you need an email or a list beforehand. So we, we pushed really big for a month of trying to get, you know, hmm. um, you know, qualified individuals who would support us. So we had about 500, which is probably about a quarter of what we should have had. Um, you know, we went from, uh, uh, let's launch it to launching it in, um, one month. And so that was, that was probably not enough time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there, uh, some people recommend like three or four months. So, um, what we also knew we had a simpler product. It wasn't like a, a piece of hardware uh, mm-hmm. that has a lot more uh, uh, complications uh, into making something like that happen. And so we, um, yeah, we really feel like we, uh, uh, you know, it, it was very purposeful. It wasn't just, Hey, let's just put this out there and hope that mm-hmm. it gets funded. We're like, okay, let's do everything we can do to make it successful before it even launches. And, mm-hmm. and, I mean, th- those skills are super helpful in business and, you know, they, you, you need them to launch and then you need them, you know, every step of the way. So that's, um, you know, it was really purposeful um, and, and uh, you know, even down to, hey, our packaging looks like cigarette packs or, hey, uh, hey, we can get them printed for cheap because that's a common thing there to have the, the molds. It looks kind of cool, especially in the the, the coffee world, it's a, it's a really Instagrammable mm. kind of package. It's, it's a little edgy. Um, you know, I, there are some people that would criticize us for those. And then I would joke and say, Oh, sorry, we're going to put them in condom packages. Uh, <laughs> and then we decided for cigarettes instead. Um, so uh, yeah, th- I mean, it, it wasn't, I guess a mistake that we were successful on Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, and if you go out there and, and find the information, there's a lot of good info. Um, and, um, it's not, not that hard. Yeah. And I always say the best brands are ones where you don't even know how you know about it. Third wave water is a great example of that for me is like, even before Barnaby convinced me that I should be using this at home frequently. Uh, I, I just knew about it. And what are you, what have you done outside of Shark Tank outside of your Kickstarter to grow the brand? Because I almost (laughs) on a, more niche scale within the coffee world. It's like, you don't call uh, facial tissues, facial tissues. You call them Kleenex. 
And you don't, yeah. I can't even think of another brewing mineral packet outside of third wave water. Yeah, this, that was intentional. We, we were looking for names. We actually had a spreadsheet going of what we should call it. And this was that first month before we launched. And so we had probably 15 to 20 uh, options. We then had check marks. So like, is the URL available? Uh, is the, is the um, name available on social networks? You know, which ones is it? And so, um, and then, you know, kind of pros and cons. And, uh, you know, early on, again, trying to describe it, we're like, it's kind of like, you know, water for third wave coffee and then third wave water. And so that was kind of one of those early, hey, this isn't bad, but let's go ahead and, 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 and look at all of the different options. And so, you know, that was really the, um, uh, uh, going into that. So that, that was the name. When we first uh, launched it, we sent it to about 50 different kind of influential people in the coffee industry. Um, those were, uh, so we got a lot of feedback early on, but our, our second customer ever on our website was Socratic coffee. Our, uh, fourth customer was department of brewology. Um, and so th those were a lot of people who, you know, are, are kind of heavy hitters in that, um, in the coffee world. And when, when we kind of saw early on that those were the people that were, you know, really into it. We, we knew we had something, uh, like I said, one of the people I had met years before was, were the guys at Onyx coffee. we had sent them samples. Um, they were obviously skeptical and we got a email from, um, uh, Mark, um, the, the roaster there. Um, and, uh, he had, uh, the, I, they had all, they had about seven Q graders, uh, and they did a double blind or just a blind, uh, taste. Um, and, um, they said they all preferred third way water to their own <laughs> filtered water at the cafe. So they already had a filter system and, and uh, that was really, you know, good validation early on. That's huge. Um, and uh, yeah. And then just a lot of the competitors kind of who are getting ready to compete uh, in, in the, in the, the, the coffee uh, competition uh, got a hold of us early kind of word of mouth. Um. Yeah, so I think within the specialty coffee realm, um, you know, we really focused on Instagram because we we felt like that was where yeah. most of the specialty coffee people are. Um, the the you know we're we're very purposeful in that. So uh, again, it was uh, you know reading a lot of things on okay, how can we make a product that is uh, you know uh, kind of for the special niche market, but also can be taken into the broader market? How do we package it? How do we do pricing? How do we do, you know, Hey, how can we package ourselves? And early on, we were actually hand weighing out stuff. We, we bought about 10 gunpowder scales. So they used to uh, pack bullets and we put the powder in that and it would trickle the, the minerals and 23.1 grains of gunpowder is equal to uh, 1.5 grams and so it would just, we'd just pick up the trays and pour them into these little vials. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, so I, early on, I mean, it was completely not profitable at all, but the idea was, okay, can we test the market? Can we get feedback? Can we, you know, we, we, we need to get something to market to test. And, and that was the, that first kind of iteration. Yeah, that's super smart as opposed to going, hey, we need to be profitable right away. Let's get all the machinery you need. Let's invest. Let's put all of our money into being efficient. Then if you figure out you have the wrong product on the back end, you're screwed versus yeah. hey, let's yeah. not be profitable and let's make sure people love our product before we even try to enter the market at a full scale. Yes. And so if you're going to fail, you want to fail early um, and, and you want it to be as cheap as possible. So the stick packaging machine uh, you know, the cheapest one that we could find was $25,000. So, I mean, that was the, the entry for us just to get that right. And then you start looking at, okay, if you want custom packaging, now you got, you know, you have to order $5,000 worth of, you know, stuff ahead of time for this, for that. And then, you know, I mean, there's, I mean, you, you know, in any startup, you just, you always underestimate the costs by about by about double and then you you overestimate your sales by about double um <laughs> and and then you just work your tail off and and don't have a life yeah and so are you doing any sort of trade shows or any like in, obviously not now with everything being closed down but pr prior to covid 
were you doing trade shows, any sort of uh, in-person or more traditional marketing methods to grow the brand? Yeah, we, we do. We, we go to a lot of trade shows. I mean, trade shows, are, I mean, you have to, like, uh, who are you looking for? You're looking for kind of commercial wholesale or those um, kind of business to business relationships. And those are more at those coffee trade shows. Uh, we found that trade shows that kind of are, are like the coffee festivals in cities that are, that are more geared towards getting local people to taste the coffees of different local roasters aren't mm-hmm. the best for us because again, we're, you know, we have a limited pool of people inside of, of that who would be a, a candidate for third way water, but we sponsor those because they're really good for us to getting into those cafes and those relationships mm-hmm. with those cafes. So, and then we use kind of, you know, those industry, um, I'd been going to, uh, like symposiums and trade shows for a long time before. Um, I remember we, we had it in, in Seattle, uh, like six, eight years ago, um, kind of twice in a row. And I stayed at a hostel, uh, downtown, um, and, uh, you know, bought food at target so I could, you know, uh, you know, pay to go to the symposium. And that's where I met you know, a lot of influential people and it kind of really helped, um, you know, when we did launch third way water, you know, who do we send samples to? Like one, one morning I was eating breakfast and Willem Boot uh, comes and sits down uh, and it's just like, Hey, he talked about, you know, he's forgotten more about coffee than I'll ever remember. And, mm-hmm. you know, he got to talk for an hour about, you know, really cool sciencey nerdy stuff. So, um, uh, so yeah, that, that that's kind of, it's, it's really one of those, investing in really long-term relationships doesn't have maybe an immediate payoff, but, mm-hmm. but those, those do. So it's, it's, it's always a balance. Okay. What are marketing things that we can get a return on investment or at least measure something where we get a return. And then what are ones that are kind of a wash um, mm-hmm. or, or a loss on. And then um, you know, it really comes down to budgeting because you can just, throw money away really quickly on, on advertising and marketing. Yeah. And, and um, you know, sometimes we just want to go places because, Hey, this is a really cool city and, and let's do it. So. Yeah. Sometimes advertising and marketing is like the easy thing to do and it makes you feel like you're doing something. And then <clears throat> especially now with Facebook and Instagram, you'll do a post and they'll be like, do you want to boost this? And from every professional uh, marketer I've heard, they've been like, never do that. You have to be more strategic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So at this point is your only product. Are you launching for the home consumer? So you have the packets for the one gallon uh, for the classic profile. Is that your only product when you launch? Uh, when we launched, yeah. we also had the espresso. So, so, so you did have both profiles to launch? W- no, no, actually. So no, when we launched it, it was just classic and then when we did our our kickstarter um we had uh uh heard from a lot of people that hey well um uh, some folks from la marzocco had reached out to us and been like hey this doesn't jive with what we need in water and so uh early on we kind of um like okay we need another kind of profile that's more because with espresso machines you that balance of maintenance and taste there's even more so on the maintenance. So the, the, mm. um, the uh, alkalinity needs to be higher. It needs to have, you know, no chlorides. It, there, there were uh, a lot more kind of uh, things to balance. And so that when we made the espresso profile, that was um, kind of when we did our Kickstarter. That, uh, that, so it was, you know, two, three months after was, was kind of went from classic to the espresso. Okay. And at, when did you get into the five-gallon game? Cause that's what I was really excited to find. Yeah. Yeah. So we had some of that early on, but they were in these big, just plastic test tubes. And so uh, once we got our stick packaging machine, it got easy to do, you know, multiple variants. So we can just change out kind of like this puck that's in that machine and, and then, um, you know, get, get the, the different volumes. Um, and so we had that early on. We do have, I mean, like we keep pushing stuff. We now have um, these, um, boxes for I can't see them the lights washes them go. out for these are like five gallon boxes for, for reference like this is the one gallon and then the five oh, gallon okay. is so it's a lot bigger um, the the uh, we're launching a new profile um, at the end of this month so uh, it is a um, 
don't know if I should say this. It's I a know. Dark, <laughs> I see. It's a, you're, you're going to yeah, say it's a, it's a it's a dark roast profile. Interesting. So, so again, uh, maybe it's probably not something that coffee professionals will dig, but the I have this theory on really what drives taste in regions, and you know, uh, sh- really shorthand, you would say that East Coast West Coast likes light roast. Uh, all the flyover states, um, uh, a lot more people that like dark roasts. Uh, and I think a lot of that is because of the water they have to begin with. So a light roast tastes bad with hard water and a dark roast tastes bad with soft water. And so the, uh, our, but in that hard water, uh, a lot of that taste comes from alkalinity. So our goal is to make a profile that had much, much higher alkalinity, but with no temporary hardness. So you'll get those flavors of nuts, chocolates. Uh, uh, it won't um, completely overwhelm the cup where it's, it's dry or um, kind of, you know, uh, you can get so much where you get kind of more of a, a charcoal or a rubbery kind of taste, but it also won't ruin your equipment. And so, Again, that was kind of feedback that we had gotten from people, uh, from customers who'd be like, oh, I don't really like this. We'll probably hear it where someone's like, I don't like it. It tastes bitter. And what what you mean it tastes like acidic? Does it taste yeah. like lemon? Lemon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's what it tastes like. And and so that's how they describe acidity is bitter. It tastes bitter. And Thank so, you. I've been trying to say that for years and people are like, no, it's not what I'm talking about. It's like, I yeah. guarantee it. And, and that's, that's, that's okay. They have it. They definitely yeah. know what they like and don't like, um, yeah. you know, they haven't explored their palate and, and the vocabulary of, of those tastes. And again, you know, that's uh, our, we, we want to meet customers where they're at and then slowly nudge them along. Um, yeah. You know, uh, and, and so, uh, our thought was, Hey, let's, and again, we'll test it out. We'll see what people, what people think. We are hoping that, um, you know, when people, um, Hey, let's give third wave water a try. If they pick out kind of the profile that they want correctly in the beginning, we'll get less turnover. Um, we'll have more uh, happy customers. Um, and, uh, you know, and especially with, with that equipment maintenance, if you have hard water, uh, you know, your, you, you, your expensive equipment, you know, breaks down in like a year. Mm-hmm. And so, I know a lot of people that just buy cheap coffee makers because they plan on it. Oh, it's getting clogged up. I just throw it out um, or it stopped getting hot or it got super hot. And then now it doesn't get hot at all. And I just toss it. And um, you know, a lot, there's a lot more, you know, high end, nicer coffee makers out there that, that, you know, help with making, just make it easier. You can get really good coffee out of a Mr. Coffee. But again, you have to do a lot of tweaks to it to, to really, and you have to baby it. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that, 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 that was, that's kind of that goal. Um, and, uh, and you know, we have ideas for, for even more stuff in the future. Yeah. Was, that'll be kind of my last question is what's it look like for third wave water moving forward? Is it taking your existing lineup and then adding the dark roast and pushing that, or is it the five gallon, the one gallon, the home consumer? Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. We even have some stuff these cool things are called uh, jug covers and it's uh, I don't know if it focus um, these, these there we go. kind of <laughs> neoprene uh, covers for your, for your, so you're tired of people stealing your third way water at home, you know, to make the Kool-Aid <laughs> and you can mark your territory and you can, even if you're in competition, kind of write your uh, profile with your the TDS you have on it, you have some pockets for some accessories. Yeah. Um, so uh, business side, this was a product that, uh, gym people use to drink gallon jugs at the gym and mm-hmm. then they can put their ID and their keys on it. And we kind of found a supplier and like, Hey, we can make these for, for our customers. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a little bit of both. We have, we want to make more things for specialty coffee people, you know, kind of pushing the leading bleeding edge of that. Uh, and, but we're also uh, continuing to try to meet this uh, larger market. Uh, and so more and more people are moving to, um, you know, specialty coffee, the, the term is, is really broad uh, industry term, but most third wave coffee professionals have a much, much more narrow kind of view of that. But um, as we're, you know, it, it, like you guys are educating customers from their current coffee habits 
And once mm-hmm. they start kind of tasting these flavors that they never tasted before, right? There's, there's no going back. They're like, Oh yeah, I really exactly. like these. Um, yeah. I don't like, you know, my favorite was we had a really good uh, Swiss water decaf that, that was roasted fully. You know, it wasn't, wasn't light roast, wasn't dark roast. And you know, it was, it was 15, $16 a pound. Um, I think it went up to 17 or 18 and someone would get it uh, and they'd be like, I, I've never spent this much money on coffee. Someone would buy it for them as a present. They drink it at home. They then switch back to their old decaf uh, and they're like, okay, I can't drink this anymore. And, uh, and they're almost mad, but not mad. Like, Oh, like, what have you done? Um, and, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I think there's a ton of people that are, that keep doing that every day, having those relationships with different yeah. cafes. And, you know, it's our job is your job, not mine anymore as a, as a cafe owner is uh, the breeze is out there. Like, how do we, you know, we don't tell them go, go and buy a McCulloch grinder, right? That's not applicable. We, we, recommend a, a home grinder. We don't, we don't say, Hey, go buy this, you know, a uh, high end coffee equipment that we have at the shop. We say, okay, this is a tool for you can use at home to get, you know, close to. And so a uh, third way water is another one of those tools mm-hmm. that, um, you know, they can try out and, and it could be one of those, you know, it could be the missing key for them if they're mm-hmm. having difficulty. Absolutely. That's exactly what it's become in my coffee inventories. I ran out a couple of days ago. I've got another one showing up tomorrow, but I ran out and these two or three days, it's like, well, I guess I'll just have a coffee versus like getting excited yeah, and waking yeah. up and knowing what we're going to be drinking. And so that's, that's where it really clicked for me. I was like, this is a great idea. And so you took something that I think a lot of you know, business people, the shark tank type people look at it and go, that's way too niche. That's, it doesn't make any sense, but I look at it and go, you know, it's a dollar a packet, roughly. That's a gallon of water to brew however many cups, you know, you're brewing a 10 ounce cup of coffee. It's sense, uh, it, it's, it's like a dime per cup if you're brewing in a certain way. If that's going to make it that much better to where you're enjoying every single morning for like 10 cents, I look at that and go like, how many things can you spend 10 cents on? You go, that makes my morning better or that yeah, makes ab- something I absolutely. enjoy better. And, and so, we do that on a daily basis. We go to the yeah. store and say, Hey, there's cheap toilet paper and here's nice toilet paper. And yep. you know, you know, my butt deserves nice toilet paper. I'm going to spend the premium on it. And so <laughs> that's uh, another one that I never yeah. skimp on that. <laughs> and so, and yes, you could, you know, make your own, uh, you know, there are ways to save money, but a lot of people, even coffee people, they used to make their own water at home. They had all these minerals sitting on the counter, you know, they look like breaking bad. <laughs> they, they, and then honestly, it, it's, it's, it, it takes a, a second to figure out, okay, how do I mix these? Mm-hmm. You don't need to mix it again, maybe for, you know, two, three months. And then you're like, oh shoot, I forgot how to do that again. Okay. I need to dig all this stuff out. Um, and, and, uh, and, and yeah, you can do that and save a couple pennies. But uh, I think that a lot of people like, Hey, this is easy. This is simple for me. Um, you know, I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, the, or, or, uh, you know, I might make stuff at home, but I'm traveling or I'm going to see family and I, I don't want my coffee to taste like trash. So yeah. I'm going to take this with me. Yep. That's exactly it. And it's also a very valuable tool. If you are comparing coffees with someone that you're not physically with, uh, that is something that is a huge issue. I think is if you send someone coffee and you're comparing tasting notes and you're way off, you don't know, do I taste differently than this person? Do we have different preferences? If you can control all the variables, including water, that's where another valuable piece is, hey, let's all use third wave classic profile when we're cupping these coffees so we know we're getting the same thing. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah that's ultimately what led to the decision that we're doing a weekend tasting room. So we have these mobile coffee units and the goal is like brewery style tours where we are educating people on coffee. Because just like you said, I think when people learn about it, when they taste it, it's hard to go back. And so- is it easier to get spring water in five gallon jugs? Yeah. And it's cheaper. It's easier. There's more suppliers out there. It was kind of hard to find someone that could do five gallon distilled, but I found someone. The ultimate decision was, Hey, if we're like bringing people in to say, this is folly coffee, you're tasting it directly from us. I was like, we can't cut corners even with water, even though it'd be easier to take it out of the tap or get uh, sources of spring water or something because there's more suppliers out there. I was like, if we want it to be the best tasting shot of espresso they've had or cup of coffee, 
this is what we need to do. And so I was really excited to find out you did wholesale, which you do. Uh, we'll plug there yes. for the five gallons. So we'll be rocking the espresso profile for our espresso and then the classic. Yep. Oh, yeah, we yeah. even have uh, cigarette cartons for our, uh, our, <laughs> our wholesale customers. That's awesome. So we, oh, we, we have a new, a new product. It's a, it's a mixer. Um, you actually put it on a drill and it's got uh, little wings that, that close in and you Sign stick it in up. and it, it splays out. So uh, Sign me up. I'll, uh, I'm buying I, one of those for sure. I think I'm not sure if we have it on the website. We'll we'll try to get it on by the end of the week. So we let just let me got know in. when it comes up for real, and I'll shoot a little video of us using it too. That sweet, yeah, it makes things really easy. You don't have to pick them up and manhandle those five gallons to yeah yeah to mix it. Uh, but really excited to have you on the podcast. I'm gonna do a little intro that's kind of uh, summarize what everything's about. So I'll I'll include that you do wholesale, that you've got these new innovations. We're we're really excited to have you in the tasting room. It's definitely going to be a highlight of our tour uh, that even the water we're using is the best you can use. And it's exciting because we can also say you can do this at home too. And that's the ultimate goal is that we're showing people things that it's not you go to a shop and you go, oh, we've got our Slayer espresso machine here and we've got our, uh, you know, our $2,000 grinder. It's like, okay, that's exciting for that cup of coffee, but we want to get people excited about coffee every day. And so that, I think that's what I love about third wave water is it's not some, uh, something that you can only get at a cafe. It's something you can do very easily at home for a very inexpensive cost in my opinion. Um, and so I am going to end this recording. It, awesome. It should, in theory, give me the option to save.